I'm going to let you in on an open secret. I have no talent in mixing music or t-shirt design. I cannot do an English accent, Irish accent, or Afrikaans accent to save my life. Nor do I have the vocal range to give you the deep-voiced opening you hear at the start of each episode. The good news for me is there is always Fiverr. Fiverr.com allows you to hire freelancers for sometimes as little as $5 to do tasks that you have to get done for your business. Or sing happy birthday to your spouse in ways that are impossible for you. Or, honestly, the list could go on. Help yourself and help the show by using the link I provide in the show notes to see if Fiverr's freelancers can help you. Or, if you have anything to offer Fiverr. My show was not possible without Fiverr. Some meaningful work in your life may now become possible with Fiverr. Go ahead and open the link in our show notes right now. Now, on to our show. This is Forgotten Wars. Sir Garnet Wolseley had fought several battles and lost his sight in one eye. Wolseley's arch-rival, the leader of the India Ring of British officers, suffered an attack of brain fever as a child. This arch-rival, Frederick Roberts, lost the sight of his right eye because of this brain fever. So picture this. The commander-in-chief of all British armed forces and leader of the rival Africa Ring of British Officers, Sir Garnet Wolseley, was blind in one eye. The new Commander-in-Chief of British Armed Forces in Southern Africa, Field Marshal Lord Frederick Roberts, was blind in one eye. And the former Commander-in-Chief of British Armed Forces in Southern Africa, General Sir Redfers Buller, spoke with a lisp because of a horse kicking his teeth in decades earlier. How about that? Frederick Roberts joined his father, General Sir Abraham Roberts's British force in 1851 at age 19. That force was stationed in present-day Pakistan. Then, the Sepoy Mutiny broke out in present-day India in 1857. I'll provide you a link to a 13-minute video about that in the show notes. During the Sepoy Mutiny, Frederick Roberts saved the life of a trooper and captured the standard of one of the mutineers. These acts of courage won Frederick the prestigious Victoria Cross. Frederick established his military reputation in India, and especially his rival ring of officers, because of his famous march from Kabul to Kandahar from August to September of 1880 during the Second Afghan War. On March 5th, 1881, Sir Frederick Roberts and his staff sailed for Natal to replace the dead Major General Kale and clean up the mess Kale had made. Roberts and company landed on March 28th at Cape Town and were greeted by cries of peace. The British and Boers had already ended the First World War, the Transvaal Rebellion's hostilities. Roberts and company left in disgust as quickly as they could. They and Major General Evelyn Wood had 14,000 troops at their disposal to make things right in Natal, in South Africa. Man, would that have been a lot cheaper from the British standpoint. But the Gladstone cabinet had other priorities at that point. You can review all the closing details of the First Boer War in episode 1.13. I will link to that in the show notes as well. Roberts later served as Commander-in-Chief in India and then as Commander-in-Chief in Ireland. After working behind the scenes for years to become Commander-in-Chief of British forces in South Africa, Field Marshal Roberts got his wish after Buller's blunders piled too conspicuously high. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. 
You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. Roberts arrived again in the Cape Colony, determined not to repeat Buller's mistakes, determined not to see anything close to a repeat of what had happened after Machuba nearly 20 years before. Roberts commanded an overall force of 180,000 soldiers in South Africa. That was roughly equivalent to the combined white population of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Roberts decided against just pushing along the rail routes towards the republics because Roberts did not want to be too predictable for Boer adversaries. He did not want the Boers to easily plan when and where along the rails that they would strike the British. Roberts sought to take the fight to Bloemfontein, the capital of the Orange Free State, and thus draw commandos away from Mafeking, from Kimberley, from Ladysmith. Then, British forces could overcome Pretoria and cut off war ability to move across the railway lines and end the war. But Cecil Rhodes's antics in Kimberley eventually made Roberts change his route. With every month that Rhodes didn't get relieved in Kimberley, Rhodes's impatient demands for British rescue grew more colorful, public, and ominous. He used the Diamond Fields Advertiser, the local newspaper he owned, to complain and make his demands to the British through his writer surrogates. Rhodes did everything short of explicitly threatening to surrender Kimberley, but he implied as much quite frequently. Rhodes made Colonel Robert Keekwich's job leading the British defense of the town a nightmare. Rhodes employed so much of White Kimberly through his De Beers diamond mining operations and was paying for so much of the town's defense. So his constant complaints, insults, and veiled threats could not be completely discarded. Rhodes constantly challenged Keekwitch's authority and tried to make Keekwitch look like an idiot to anyone who would listen. Sadly for Keekwitch, one very powerful man would listen soon. A resurrection of sorts also made life worse in Kimberley. Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Hunter managed much of Lady Smith's defense during its siege. On the morning of December 8th, General Hunter led a 650-man raiding party to attack Boer positions on Gun Hill. In the process, they put two Boer artillery pieces out of commission, or at least, they thought they'd put two pieces out of commission. During the attack, they stuffed one of the Boers' only long toms full of cotton and attempted to blow it to pieces. But on January 24th, an officer keeping watch at one of Kimberley, one of Kimberley's conning towers, saw a puff of smoke in the distance. Then, then, 90-pound shells started to smash Kimberley. The long tom that General Hunter's party had previously destroyed had been brought back to life in Pretoria after extensive repairs and several inches being shaved off of its barrel. That resurrected long tom wreaked more havoc on Kimberley than the combined six Boer artillery pieces that had been trained on the town for months. Several buildings set ablaze, several people dying, and many people's spirits shaken in the Long Tom's first days of operation. All residents of Kimberley suffered. But what will probably come as less surprise to those of you who listened to episode 1.1 months ago, the black and brown people of Kimberley suffered dramatically more. Even those who could afford to buy meat and vegetables were not allowed. The infant mortality among the white population was a staggering 
50%. That's 5-0%. Black and brown children died at a 93.5% death rate. 93.5%. Rhodes took full advantage of the Long Tom's mayhem and the false rumors of 20 more Long Tom's being on their way. Posing himself as a hero yet again, Rhodes announced that people could find shelter from the Long Tom's shelling in Rhodes's nearby mines. Rhodes did this without telling Colonel Keekwich. Pakenham writes, quote, Of course, if Rhodes had told Keekwich of his scheme, the panic could have been avoided and proper sanitary facilities in the mines could have been arranged. As it was, people fled for refuge to the mine heads as though their last hour had come, dragging their children and bundles of bedding. End quote. Meanwhile, Rose prepared a victory banquet to honor Kimberly's future rescuers and war correspondents. Lord Roberts would eventually divert from his original plan of cutting a relatively straight path to Bloemfontein to indirectly relieve Kimberly and other besieged towns. Nassen describes what Roberts strived to do to prepare his troops and leaders mentally for the task at hand. Quote, Thus, Roberts made a basic contribution to the education of his troops through the wide dissemination of instructional guidance notes on South African warfare, stressing the survival imperatives of improved shooting, rapid movement, proper systems of concealment, and a freer hand to take independent individual initiative against the enemy, end quote. Roberts sought to eradicate a huge disadvantage that British forces faced in October 1899. The Boers fielded tens of thousands of mounted warriors, warriors able to operate with much greater mobility than their British adversary. In October 1899, only 14,000 mounted men stood ready for the British in South Africa. British political leaders finally authorized the purchase of tens of thousands of horses from far and wide. The British would eventually buy over 400,000 horses, mules, and donkeys from all over the world. 20,000 from the Basutu of Southern Africa, 200,000 from the United States, and thousands more from Australia from Argentina, and Russia. Read more about the story of the South African War's horses on the Forgotten War's blog before that story goes behind a paywall. At first, Roberts brought in 12,000 additional horses by early 1900. With this influx of horses came an attachment of mounted infantry to every British battalion to make themselves systematically Less conspicuous, cavalrymen's buttons were doled, lance butts painted over to prevent flashing in the sun, and even painting their gray horses to create a camouflaging zebra effect. Sadly, the imported horses were so poorly acclimated and supplied that 66% of them would be ridden to death. Thousands even died on the voyage over. Lord Roberts and his chief of staff, Lord Kitchener, tried to streamline and centralize the transport system, but this effort backfired dramatically, with major disruptions rippling through the supply chain. Lord Roberts, via Director of Military Intelligence, George Henderson, had much more detailed and accurate maps made to make the British advance less of a crapshoot. This same George Henderson authored the biography Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. Henderson was well assisted by intelligence officer Captain Willie Robertson. Captain Willie Robertson would go on to be the first Englishman ever to rise from the ranks to eventually become a field marshal. Roberts, with his intelligence department, also sought to wield a weapon that sounds foreign to just about every battle the British fought in the war to this point. 
Piet Cronier's Wars sat entrenched behind Maher's Fontaine at this point. To prevent further setbacks in their drive towards Bloemfontein, Roberts' forces tried to wield surprise as much as possible. Roberts placed 60,000 of his men between the Modder and Orange Rivers and reinforced Major General French's force outside Colesburg. Cronier assumed from all this that the British would move directly towards Kimberley. British military intelligence tried to confirm this assumption by trying to spread as many rumors and false reports as they could through spies, both black and white. Bogus telegrams were sent rather openly to field commanders, only to be canceled in code. They intentionally chose a war correspondent with loose lips to feed false, confidential information. All this drew Cronier forward with 8,000 men to stop an anticipated British frontal assault. Instead, the British made a wide circling movement eastwards to outflank Cronier. French's cavalry division, on the other hand, left Colesburg to wheel around the Boer at Mahersfontein and head for Kimberley. However, French's men left behind their tents to further confuse the Boers into seeing Brits where there were none. General Christian de Vette was dispatched hours later to keep up with French's wheel route. All these feints, all this uncertainty, wore war commandos' nerves thin. From February 11th to February 15th, French drove his force hard, losing 500 horses in severe heat to lack of water and exhaustion. But 6,000 cavalrymen completed the wheeling around war forces and shot across the Mare River's fords towards Kimberley. 800 Boer riflemen fired a few random volleys and then fled. French's force closed in above and around Kimberley, causing the Boer besiegers to melt away even more. Meanwhile, Roberts's massive infantry columns slowly followed the general direction of French's cavalry, but veered to crush any remaining Boer resistance in Tall, Cronier's recently abandoned headquarters. But Roberts's rear received attention. Christian de Vette led 1,000 mounted Boers in an attack on Roberts's rear transport column, a column including 200 stockpiled wagons. De Vette's men fired into the column's oxen to successfully create a stampede. They captured those wagons with 140,000 rations of biscuits, jam, milk, sardines, salmon, corned beef, and more to be sent back to Bloemfontein. Roberts would not risk an attack from Cronier on his writ to modern communication line by sending soldiers back to recapture the lost supplies. So Roberts' sweating men suffered on half rations or less. With the knowledge that thousands of British cavalry and tens and thousands of infantry were closing in, Boers continued to melt away towards their homes. But before French started blowing up Boer wagons, he made a momentous pit stop. Pakenham argues that French virtually destroyed his cavalry division by driving these unclimatized horses so hard across scores of miles to Kimberley. After more than 120 days of hell, the town of Kimberley saw a heliograph's message at 4 p.m. on February 15th. The message announced the coming of French's relief force. Soon after, a patrol of Australian horse led French's relief force to Kimberley, and then into Kimberley. The Boer besiegers had all but vanished. Rhodes immediately captured the ear of French, even though French must have been well aware of how much Rhodes's whining had altered Roberts's plans. After half an hour of throwing a lavish party for French and company, Rhodes convinced French to do his bidding. When Colonel Keekwich finally stopped planning a capture of the Boer Long Tom, he approached Sanatorium Hotel, where Rhodes's party raged. Rhodes tried to deny Keekwich's entrance, but Keekwich pushed past to report himself officially to General French. 
Keekwitch was not savvy with words. Certainly not like Rhodes was. Keekwitch's meeting with French was disastrous. French accused Keekwitch of being overbearing and tyrannical towards Rhodes, something Rhodes would have accused any in Keekwitch's position of. Two days later, Colonel Keekwitch returned to his office to find Colonel Porter, CO of the 1st Cavalry Brigade, sitting in Keekwitch's now former desk. French didn't even bother to tell Keekwitch that he had been relieved before this, and before French rode away to Parterberg. After Kimberly was relieved, Cronier had at least three choices. Pakenham writes, quote, Since the collapse of the British cavalry, Cronier could safely withdraw to the north along the railway towards Mafeking. Alternatively, he could lie in wait for Roberts's ponderous bullock columns and wage guerrilla war against his communications. Or third, he could retreat eastwards across the open felt to help block the expected advance on Bloemfontein. End quote. Cronier held a crake's rod the night that Kimberly's siege was broken. What happened that night? Cronier ignored his subordinate officers, General Ignatius Ferreira and General Christian de Vets, urging for a counterattack. Cronier and a majority of the Craig's Rod chose option three. General Ignatius Ferreira led a retreat north, and Cronier started to pull his men away from Maher's Fontaine towards Bloemfontein. 5,000 Boers abandoned their Maher's Fontaine defenses under cover of darkness, bringing 500 wagons and thousands of horses with them. This heavily laden retreating force moved slowly enough for Major General French to send 1,200 of his cavalry to block their path. Lord Kitchener's massive infantry force clashed with Cronier's force from the east at Clip Kral Drift. The British suffered 123 casualties, while Boer suffered only 20. Cronier continued the Boer retreat and reached Par de Berg's drift at midnight. The next day, Lord Kitchener took personal command while Lord Roberts remained in Akobstal, suffering a severe chill. French started shelling the Boers on February 17th, splintering their wagons blowing holes in the ground all around where Cronier's force was trapped, at a drift on the Mater River, near Parterberg. While taking the initiative, French had to stay on the lookout for two threats, Ferreira and De Vette. Both Ferreira and De Vette were leading 1,500-man contingents of commandos in pursuit of French and his now greatly diminished cavalry. Only 1,500 of French's original 5,000 cavalry were fit for duty. But then, Kitchener's gigantic infantry force fully arrived February 18th, after covering 30 miles in just 24 hours. Roberts's chief of staff was chomping at the bit. Roberts had given Kitchener a lot of freedom for this campaign, and Kitchener was ready to wield that freedom aggressively, too aggressively. Field Marshal Roberts was a usually level-headed man, even in moments of great stress. The one time, the one time he could not hold back his emotions was shortly after he docked at Cape Town. Roberts summoned Captain Congreve, one of the men who had bravely answered General Buller's call to recover Colonel Long's stranded artillery pieces at the Battle of Colenso. Captain Congreve is the same man who rode beside Lieutenant Freddie Roberts on that mission, on that mission that cost Lieutenant Freddie Roberts his life. Back at Cape Town, Field Marshal Roberts said to Captain Congreve, tell me what happened. Then, Roberts broke down in tears, a rare show of emotion that would have made most soldiers feel at a loss. Lord Horatio Kitchener, on the other hand, preferred pretending to have no human emotions, or at least that is what Pakenham reports. Pakenham does come across as having a serious bone to pick with Kitchener. 
This is how Pakenham describes Kitchener. Quote, No one could imagine Kitchener, like Wellington, sickened by the sufferings of his own soldiers. He preferred to be thought a monster than be thought sentimental. He flaunted his indifference to pain. He allowed oriental punishments, like the lopping of hands and legs for trivial offenses, to be continued after his conquest of the Sudan, gloated in the desecration of Mahdi's tomb, ordered the Mahdi's bones to be cast into the Nile. He himself toyed with the skull and said it might be fun to make it into an inkstand or drinking cup. At this point, the Mahdi had almost won his revenge. The affair of the Mahdi's skull caused a hullabaloo in England. The row fizzled out, but many people were left with an unpleasant taste in their mouths. Not a very likable fellow, said Lord Croma to Lord Salisbury, with masterly understatement. Even Kitchener's intimate friends were appalled by the callous way he talked. He was a maze of contradictions. In his personal habits, he was fastidiously clean, his uniform spotless, his mustache oiled and clipped. But his office looked as though it had not been tidied for years. Papers littered every chair and windowsill. End quote. So what did this man with lots of contradictions, this man with lots of latitude from Lord Roberts, this man with a gigantic infantry force, do? when he arrived February 18th. Kitchener moved quickly for an all-out assault on Cronier's Laher, with little thought given to coordinating how his 15,000 Brits would make this assault. Before the main assault began, General French drove off General Ferreira's 1,500 or so boars coming from the north. Then French really took the wind out of Cronier's sails, by capturing 2,000 oxen from Cronier's convoy. Some of Cronier's officers urged the assistant commandant general to leave the Lahar behind and cross the Madere River on foot. But Cronier refused to leave supplies and horses behind that he believed vital to making any real resistance against Roberts's advance to Bloemfontein. Cronier liked the natural defensive positions offered on the side of the river that the Lahar sat on. The tree and thicket covered riverbanks, the hills, the ridges, the natural trenches formed by ditches running to the Madere River. All this appeared to be great ground to defend. Lieutenant General Kelly Kenny led the 6th Division and technically outranked Lord Kitchener. But after the previous four days of being frustrated by Kitchener, received a private telegram from Lord Roberts saying that any directive from Kitchener was to be understood as an order from Roberts. This took care of some of the ambiguity, but arguably proved to be a deadly decision. General Kelly Kenny had originally hoped to completely surround Cronier and seal him off from any rescue from the roaming mounted men of Ferreira and De Vett. Then, bomb the trapped Cronier into surrender. This plan was not to be. As we said before, Kitchener hurriedly called for an all-out assault. So on February 18th, Kitchener launched a three-pronged attack from the west of war positions, from the south of war positions, and from the east of war positions. Pakenham puts Kitchener's plan like this, quote, hold the Boers down with a frontal attack from the plain to the south, then simultaneously fling a right hook from upstream and a left hook from downstream. This was Kitchener's simple tactical plan. End quote. Kitchener showed little interest in learning from the mistakes made and new challenges faced by Methuen and Buller in their attacks that involved river crossings. Kitchener and Roberts probably attributed Methuen and Buller's costly attacks more to defects in character, not older attack tactics needing to be revamped in favor of less costly maneuvers. At 7 a.m., Kitchener turned his wrist to his face 
and then told his staff officer, we shall be in the Lahar by half past 10. But Kitchener cemented one of his nicknames, K of Chaos. He hated writing orders down and instead only gave verbal orders. To make matters worse, Kitchener did not delegate well and was very controlling, yet disorganized in how he sent his verbal orders out. Lieutenant General Kelly Kenney's 6th Division attacked the Boers south of the river with 38 British guns covering their advance. Those 38 guns silenced the German Major Richard Albrecht's five war guns almost instantly. Several wagons in the Lahar sat in flames, with food and ammo burning helplessly. But Boers in the riverbanks were unscathed by the British bombardment. These Boers fired away at Kelly Kenny's 6th Division to where the division stopped a half mile from the river at about 9 a.m. after several failed attempts to reach the Boers. Then the rest of the 6th Division crossed the river to the north bank and attacked the Boer right flank and took Gun Hill from the Boers by 11 a.m. However, they could not crush the Boer right flank due to concentrated Boer rifle fire and Albrecht's guns going back into action. English soldiers could only get within half a mile of Boer positions on the right flank, while Canadians got within 300 yards by nightfall. The third prong of the British attack came from the east, while the 6th Division attacked from the south. Colonel Hannay's Mounted Infantry Brigade took control of Fonda Berg's drift between 7.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. and eventually linked up with part of French's 2nd Brigade. But before Hannay's men could begin a coordinated attack on the Boer right and left flank, General Ferreira and company harassed these Brits for two hours before being swatted away. At noon, Colonel Hannay and his men crossed the river at Fonda Berg's Drift and joined with three more British companies before stopping about 500 yards away from war positions near the north bank. Hannay then wrote to Kitchener, saying he could go no further. Other Brits stopped within 1,000 yards of war positions at Fen Duty Drift. Kitchener replied to Hannay at 3 p.m. demanding that Hannay and his men rush the Boer Lahar at all costs. Believing that Kitchener was wasting lives in this stupid charge, Hannay personally led 50 men in a charge at the Lahar. Imagine that you mount your horse and lead 50 men on horseback to what you think will be certain death. You gallop for 250 yards and then rocket off your horse after it's shot out from under you. But you won't turn back. You continue your death wish forward on foot until you are shot dead 200 yards from the enemy. The rest of your group is mowed down or are smart enough to break off or lucky enough to be taken prisoner. Elsewhere along the line, Brigadier General Stevenson sends his Welshmen forward with fixed bayonets against Boers who awaited in their trenches. The Boer defenders here shot up the Welshmen to where their charge collapsed some 500 yards away from the Boer lines. Pakenham writes, quote, The left hook failed, and Hannay had died just as he intended, as a supreme act of protest against the way Kitchener sacrificed his army. End quote. Despite being greatly outnumbered, the Boers were holding on. Around 5.15 p.m., General Colville complied with Kitchener's demands to send half a battalion across the Madere River to launch the right hook at the Boers. Major General Smith Dorian looked on with surprise as he watched these Brits alongside his 19th Brigade make this charge. Smith Dorian had no directions from Kitchener since the morning when his 19th Brigade crossed the Madere River. He had no idea that first Royal Canadians under his command had been ordered by Kitchener to join in this right hook. Smith Dorian had no time to stop these Canadians or coordinate an attack alongside them. All he could do 
was wash, as the charge evaporated about 300 yards from the Boers, and as Colonel Aldworth leading the charge was shot down. Kitchener's hasty right hook failed. General Christian Devet and General Philip Botta showed up shortly before nightfall, while Kitchener was coordinating his right and left hooks against Cronier. They shocked Kitchener and drove British troops off of a kopi that sat immediately south of the Madeira River. Kitchener had earlier pulled troops from this kopi that would ultimately be nicknamed after him. Devet's timing was perfect. Only a hundred mounted Oitlanders held the kopi and farm buildings nearby. Their horses stampeded away. The Oitlanders surrendered themselves quickly. With just a few hundred men, Devet captured the tactical key to Parterberk. Here, Devet could make life impossible for Brits holding positions south of the Madeira. Devet and company then opened fire on the 6th Division below with two guns and rifle fire. Ferreira's gunners joined the counterattack, firing from east of the Oscopis. This will be the last you hear of Ferreira because just a couple days later, a very vigilant but also very short-sighted war sentry accidentally shot and killed General Ferreira. The second Gloucestershire's and second Buffs with the 76th Battery tried to drive Christian de Vett from the Oscopis, but these Brits were checked. The Copi could also serve as the escape ladder for Cronier's 4,000-man force. French's 3rd Cavalry Brigade finished their sprint back from Kimberley. With their 12 guns and 38 more of Kitchener's guns, they drove away some wars lingering east of Kudosrant. Before darkness fell, 303 Brits had fallen, along with nearly 1,000 more wounded and taken prisoner. The Brits suffered between four times as many casualties, or almost 20 times as many casualties, as the Boers. Cronier and company synthesized the natural terrain and trenches to excellent effect, with few casualties from the British bombardment. War casualty estimates vary considerably from between 70 and 350 casualties. Cronier's men, regardless, suffered blows to their morale being surrounded, being bombarded, and many of them watching wagons with all their life's possessions being blown to bits. But there wasn't space for Boer horses to hide. Parterberk turned into a graveyard for most of the Boer's horses. Imagine looking out across the felt from your shelter at your wagon as it burns to the ground, your horse laying motionless and bloated, and, in about 50 cases, with your wife beside you to take all this in. Maybe you were even one of the Boers who had previously been on the other end of the siege of Mafeking, the siege of Kimberley, or even one of the Boers who besieged the Baganawa, the Unzunza, or even the British, nearly 20 years before, during the First Boer War, the Transvaal Rebellion. Now you were the one hemmed in with no escape. Maybe now you're looking back on those sieges through a very different lens. As darkness fell, Kitchener ordered those men he bothered to communicate with to have their soldiers dig in. So, not everyone got these orders. Nevertheless, Brits who had gone 24 hours without sleep, food, and water finally found relief. While these Brits finally recovered, Cronier and company could have escaped. Devet and company controlled the Kopi and had additional horses. They had a life raft. They told Cronier and company as much using frantic heliograph messages, flashing light in the darkness. Only 100 of Cronier's wars took the chance that Sunday night and Monday. That Monday, February 19th, Cronier asked for a truce so that both sides could bury their dead and so British doctors could care for war wounded since the Boers didn't have doctors on the scene. 
Lord Roberts, now on the scene, refused. Cronier then wrote, If you are so uncharitable as to refuse me a truce as requested, then you may do as you please. I shall not surrender alive. Therefore, bombard as you please. But both sides waited a while for all of the 19th while these two generals exchanged messages. Lord Roberts initially decided to renew the attack on Cronier on Tuesday, February 20th, but nearly everyone except Kitchener voiced their disapproval. Then on Wednesday, Roberts must have sounded bipolar to General Kelly Kenny when Roberts proposed retreating to clip Kral Drift. Kelly Kenny was incredulous. Kelly Kenny urged Roberts not to fall back, but Roberts insisted they must. Roberts felt overwhelmed by a combination of a lack of ambulances, a transport system in chaos, his army in disarray and lacking clean water, and Devet's men still holding Kitchener's copy. Thomas Pakenham's book, The Boer War, publicized this planned retreat for the first time when the book was published in 1979. Part of why this plan stayed a secret for so long is Roberts changed his mind. An hour or two before Roberts's planned surrender, DeVette and company withdrew from Kitchener's copy. Roberts continued bombarding the Boers, holding Parterberg on Tuesday and on Wednesday until... Roberts formally recognized the presence of about 60 women and children in the Boer ranks. He offered them safe passage from the battle, but the Boers refused this offer. Then Roberts resumed, trying to bomb the Boers into submission. Roberts now had 100 guns and 40,000 men surrounding Cronier. Persistent poor weather prevented De Vett from consistently communicating with Cronier and coordinating Cronier's escape. Then, on Saturday the 24th, De Vett got a man through British lines to Cronier. The man's message? Pack up and escape on our signal. Cronier this time was willing, but not able. Most of his officers, so demoralized from days of being trapped and shelled, physically wrecked from drinking food contaminated by dead animals, and eating food that smelled like the British artillery shells, and who were sleep-deprived. Most of his officers in this state said no. They would not follow Cronier if he attempted a breakout. They threatened to surrender if Cronier tried to lead a breakout. Cronier, on February 25th, those officers be damned, went to work building a bridge for those who were willing to cross the Mare River, to escape the British noose. The British smashed this bridge with artillery the next day. Cronier held a crake's rod that night of the 26th. Cronier tried to convince his wars to at least delay a surrender until February 28th. That way they could avoid surrendering on the anniversary of the war's glorious victory over the British at Machuba Hill on February 27th. While Cronier's wars debated dates, the British steadily dug trenches closer and closer to the Boer Lahar. At 2.15 a.m. on February 27th, Lieutenant Colonel William Otter led the first Canadian contingent in a charge that got within 50 to 90 yards of the Boer lines. The British guns shelled and British rifles fired on the Boers fiercely again. Then at 5 a.m., the Major General Smith Dorian, who Kitchener left in the dark earlier, that Major General Smith Dorian had the satisfaction of demanding a Boer surrender. White handkerchiefs flew up spontaneously all along the Boer line to where Cronier had little choice but to raise his white flag at 6 a.m. Brits escorted Cronier to Roberts. Roberts declared, I am glad to see you. You have made a gallant defense, sir. Over 1,300 Free Staters and about 2,600 Transfallers were rounded up 
and sent to prisoner of war camps on the island of St. Helena, more than a thousand miles off the southwest African coast. After their disastrous attack on February 18th that cost them around 1,300 casualties, the British only suffered about 200 more casualties for the remainder of the days preceding the Boer surrender. With that surrender, the Boers lost 10% of their army. With that surrender, the collapse of the Boer Western Front was complete. If you would like to help keep Forgotten Wars producing and growing, would you do at least two of three things? First, would you share a link to the podcast with someone you think might enjoy it? Second, if you're listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or other providers, would you make sure to like or follow our podcast? If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you give us a five-star rating and write a thoughtful review there? You can even do that while you're listening. Lastly, if you want more from the show, bonus episodes, behind-the-mic access, transcripts and sources, and much more, and you want to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash forgotten wars. That is patreon.com slash forgotten wars. The link is also in this episode's notes. Thanks to those of you who have done one of these things already. Know that you're appreciated.